Welcome to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's debate on large-scale evolution or macroevolution. It is a privilege to once again have Luca Medugno and Jamie from the Studio 215 official with me here tonight for this epic debate. Always a fun topic. And uh, Jamie, you were here just a week or two ago. Uh, debating Snake Was Right. Luca, you've been here many times before as well. You're both well studied on this specific topic. And so that guarantees this to be a debate to remember. So why don't we kind of break the ice a little bit, get to know you gentlemen before we get into the opening statements. Uh, Luca, let's start with you. It's been a little while uh, since you've been here. Yes. With, the time, with the time differences, I want to first thank you so much <laughs> for being willing to basically do this in the middle of the night for you. So how you been? A little yes. bit about yourself, Luca. Yes. Uh, I, as for now, I'm working as a math, science, and English teacher in, a, in an, an elementary school in Milan. Uh, I just love to debate, as you know. And I love to do these things and cannot wait to engage with uh, Jamie. So let's have some fun. Well, I appreciate it, Luca. I'm ready for some fun as well. This is our fourth debate this week. We've had debates all week long. And so I'm pumped for this one. Mac Revolution is always a fun topic. Taylor says Luca's got a new house. So Luca, you've got a new studio. It looks good, very professional. So congratulations. Yes, uh, it's a new house indeed. Uh, so I changed places to increase my internet connection and things like that. So yeah, uh, it's a new, beautiful new place. So yes. Well, congratulations again. This is your first debate in the new studio, the first of many, Luca. So with that, Jamie from Studio 215 Official. Thank you for being back. Thanks for giving us your time for this debate. And a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your channel. Yeah, I'm glad to be back. I love it, man. Uh, that first debate was just the beginning of a very long friendship, I hope. Um, it's gonna be very interesting doing debates on here. So if anyone wants to challenge me, I accept. Um, as far as a little bit about myself, I run Studio 215. We, it's a ministry with three focuses to prepare people for what's to come, to expose the evil, and overall uh, to spread the gospel. And uh, I believe that this whole evolution argument that we always have, that's um, part of exposing the evil because it ties into a lot of other things. So I'm very excited to be here and do that. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for that introduction. Yes, this is your second debate of many. So I appreciate that. Um, as you know, as both of you know, here on Standing for Truth, we strongly believe in critical thinking, and that's why we host so many awesome debates. So for anybody who wants to see more from our debaters tonight, Luca and Jamie, do check the description box. I've got their relevant uh, links linked for people. So with that, I'm going to go over the format tonight um briefly for the audience so it is going to be more formal we're going to have 15 minute opening statements whatever is not used in the opening statements we'll put into the discussion then we're going to have an eight minute uninterrupted rebuttal followed by a roughly 30 minute discussion where luca and jamie the debaters for tonight they'll go back and forth asking each other questions and discussing the points and topics brought up in the opening statements and rebuttals then we'll have a five minute closing statement where the debaters can wrap up their thoughts and points and then everybody in the audience this is where we get you guys uh, involved so we're gonna have an audience q a always a lot of fun these audience q a so please make sure you're tagging me with your questions Tag me at either at Standing for Truth or at Donnie, and that way I won't miss them. So with that, tonight's title is, Is There Scientific Evidence for Large-Scale Evolution? Luca Medugno would say yes, and so he's in the affirmative. Jamie would say no, and so he's in the negative for tonight. Therefore, Luca, we are going to give you the floor to uh, kick us off in terms Good. of opening statements. I think that five... 15 minutes will be more than enough for me, but let's okay. try to. Okay. Okay. Oh, 
sorry. No worries. Okay. You can see my slides. Yes. Yeah, I can okay. see it. Good, good, good. So there is scientific evidence for large scale evolution. Well, of course, for me, the answer is yes, but let's see why. Yes, they are. I will, oh, sorry. I will discuss some line of evidence in the next minutes with evolution, evolution of multicellularity and the yellow spotted salamander. So that's uh, all the point of mine with why it's important. Uh, because we can actually trace the origin uh, the origin of wheat with the archaeological fundings and things like that. So we know how it happened. Uh, of course, most of you will disagree with the, the timeline, but I do not think that you can argue with the archaeological fundings why it's important because we start from uh, a plant acorn wheat that has a very let's say small genome compared to what is today wheat so only 14 chromosomes then where we go from this how far we are come that's modern wheat Tricticum estivum, and it's one of the mother species of cereal. Why it's important? Because it's an alloextrapoid, so as 42 chromosome, so six times the, sorry, three times the previous previous numbers. So where uh, all those genetic material uh, come from? Well, we actually know uh, where it came from another two plants. We start with acorn, of course, and then we have uh, another two plants that I will show in a minute. So uh, we go from acorn to an hybrid and then another hybrid. And you can find actually all uh, the genome of those three plants inside uh, the modern wheat. Uh, so uh, for me, that's uh, macroevolution because you are adding things, you are not losing anything, and the result of it is a better and stronger plant. Le to be more precise, uh, this plant is more resistant to diseases and that's why it's so uh, used uh, right now. And those kind of resistance are due to uh, the plants that made uh, hybrids with uh, acorn. So acorn is not that disease resistant. Right now, wheat is more resistant to diseases. But that's something I already said more time than one. But I want to add something new. Uh, let's say that's a little bit uh, complicated to understand the concept. So I prepare a little slide to explain what happened. Basically, we do have acorn plus this plant plus this other plant. There are the three we are talking about. Uh, they form uh, basically first uh, an hybrid between two plants and then another hybrid with the third plant. And we have as a result wheat. So what you need to understand that we have a combination of all these three plants getting a new one, a completely new one, a better one, let's say that. Uh, on the previous uh, debates, I did put some numbers on production. I can see you uh, say to you that uh, wheat is more disease resistant and uh, 
that's something. I cannot find anything that's worse in wheat, uh, between wheat and acorn wheat. So I consider this uh, evolution. And of course, it just, it's just a plant, but a plant is still a living being. So we are adding uh, genetic material, we are not losing anything, and we are gaining function. Uh, especially more production and more diseases uh, resistant, uh, more diseases uh, resistant plant. So I think it's very important to discuss this kind of thing. Evolution of multicellularity, another old point of mine, but uh, I was interested uh, to discuss this with uh, Jamie. Why? Uh, because I have this paper and I will show you the relevant part here. The strains are man uh, have maintained their evolved characteristic of simple multicellularity in a same absence of predators for four years as unfrozen in use laboratory strains. So we are not talking something that uh, regressed uh, to uh, monocellularity as long you remove uh, the bacteria predating those algae. They maintain those characteristics and they did it for at least four years. This paper is quite, I cannot say old, but it's some years old. So right now it's even more than four years. But before writing this, they waited for four years that's a lot of time for our research so it's not like they were uh, just guessing uh, they waited uh, before writing something so uh, i would love to see uh, jamie's uh, answer on this so uh how we know it well we have uh, experimental results in this little paper, we have two instances of this phenomena, I will say even three, but with different outcomes. Uh, as you see, we do have different outcomes, at least two uh, that are multicellular. So it's not like uh, it happened just one time. Uh, also, we do find another example of this kind of process in uh, uh, in some studies and I'm not using uh, uh, other uh, algae uh, or things like that because I know that Jamie will not uh, accept, accept any evidence uh, with uh, comparative, ge comparative genomic uh, or things like that so I'm uh, just stating the facts uh, we do have uh, those uh, multicellular clusters and they remain that way for all four years at least and we have the last one and <laughs> that's a cute one uh, let's say that look uh, how cute uh, this uh, creature is <laughs> it's really cute <coughs> so this uh, yellow spotted salamander is uh, common to eastern united states and canada so don't uh, you have it somewhere in your nation and it's the only known example of vertebrate cell hosting a endosymbiotic microbe what's the meaning of this because the terms are quite uh, hard to understand basically uh, when uh, the salamander is still in the egg phase a uh, um, bacteria will uh, infiltrate the cell and they it will start uh, providing uh, basically photosynthesis to the egg cell. Why it's important? Because this kind of process, it's basically uh, comparable to only two, basically, uh, the formation of um, chloroplast and uh, two mitochondria, 
and that's quite something. Uh, you have a vertebrate uh, creature able to do photosynthesis. That's a pretty cute uh, superpower. I would love to have it too, uh, to be honest. But this is a very huge step. And as I said, you can compare it just to uh, the formation of mitochondria and uh, chloroplast. Uh, and I want to remember that uh, it's not like we do not have any evidence for the um, formation of this uh, structure inside our cell. Uh, I remember that uh, those structures have a membrane, basically uh, that's the same membrane of uh, bacteria. We do have a uh, DNA that's basically the same as a bacteria and we do know that some cells eat other cells and it's how we think that happened basically some cell eat uh, a bacteria did not just it and they created from that um, a relationship between the bacteria becoming a uh, chloroplast or a mitochondria and the predator cell and it's how we get to um, our cell basically and here you can see uh, the egg cell they are green because they are doing a photosynthesis so it's quite impressive and that bacteria is inside the cell and uh, provides uh, nutrients and oxygen to the organism. So it uh, coagulates uh, its growth and uh, it's quite something, I think. And well, we will discuss it later. So I thank you, all of you, for watching this presentation. Of course, uh, for any question, contact me. That's my mail and that's my YouTube channel. <laughs> it's very, very small, but you are welcome to come anytime. Luca, thank you so much for the 12 minute on the dot. Appreciate that. 12 minute opening statement. Thanks for the visuals, clear and concise. So with that, it's Jamie, okay. now we're going to. Thank you very much, Luca. And Jamie, we're going to hand it over to you now. And you've got up to 15 minutes for your opening statement on your first word. And whenever you're ready, I'll start the timer. All right. So, Luca, you chose your target, you chose your weapon, and then you just didn't make the right shots. Um, the salamander, I was really hoping you were going to go another route. That's a little bit more interesting as far as macroevolution, but I'll go ahead and disprove that one as well. Since you want to talk about the whole symbiotic relationship. Um, however, I'm just going to go through my presentation because it kind of covers everything you already mentioned. All right. So the macroevolution debate. Now, the way I wanted to start this, because I've watched a lot of debates on macroevolution, was I noticed that in all of these debates on this specific topic, the evolution side always tries to hyper-focus on three specific questions as a way to stall from giving real scientific answers when we ask them for these answers. Um, so I'm going to start my presentation by giving clear answers to these so that we can get past the circular arguments and focus more on the specific evidence that I'm hoping to see from him. And I will give examples of what I will accept as evidence. Um, so first, what is the definition of macroevolution? Well, macroevolution, according to these scientists, is evolution that results in adding a new, large, and complex change to an organism, such as new organs or a new kind of animal. Uh, that leads to the second thing that they always like to talk about, and that is what is a kind. Um, this is a little bit harder to answer because evolutionists always want an answer that fits within their taxonomic measuring system. But there are two different forms of measurement. Uh, this is similar to how we have the metric system outside of America, and then we have the imperial system inside America. Um, so it, it's like you're asking me to fit my measurements into your measurements, and you just can't do that. They're two different forms of measurements. Um, so in the most simple terms, the definition of a kind is a group of animals that share similar features and can reproduce 
or was able to at one point in the past before mutations affected this process. Uh, with that, I think that we can kind of clarify what a kind is, even though a four-year-old could tell. Um, the third thing that they would always ask is, what would I accept as an example of macroevolution? Because, I'm, of course, I'll shoot down certain uh, evidences that you put forth because they're not really evidence. So then they always come with the question, well, what will you accept? And I'll give you a couple of examples of what I will accept. Uh, but first, I will let you know I will not accept microevolution as an example for macroevolution. I will not accept fossils because fossils can only give us limited amounts of data. I will not con accept comparative anatomy because that has the built-in assumption that they are related, and that's a circular argument. And then anything else that follows the format of we see the differences in animals today, so it must have happened at some point in the past. Just like how evolutionists tell creationists we can't use the Bible to prove the Bible, the same rules apply to you. So as far as my first example that I will accept as evidence for macroevolution, um, I would like you to explain to me in detail with solid proof, not just a story of maybe this or maybe that. Um, I would like to know how is it possible for a gill breathing fish to successfully transition to a lung breathing mammal? I've asked so many evolutionists this question, they never want to answer it. As far as I can tell, any such transition would be impossible given the evolutionary model because evolution teaches that all of these changes would result would be the result of millions of years of mutations over a long period of time. But in regards to an organism changing its breathing system, even if we ignore the fact that this is never observed and we just consider the process to see how this could possibly happen, this would have to be a very rapid change. Otherwise, the animal would not survive the transition. I mean, after all, how long can an organism go without breathing while it waits for this transition? So that's one thing that you can use to fully convince me of macroevolution. But again, I want details and solid proof. Um, just to give you a visual of the difference between these systems, here's a few charts. On the left is our uh, on the left is the gill system that the fishes use, and on the right is the lung system that a human would use. These are extremely complex systems. So please explain that to me with step by step evidence, and then I'll accept macroevolution. Another perfect example of why macroevolution is impossible is seen in the reproductive systems of different organisms. Every animal has vastly different and unique methods of reproduction, and even if one step of this process were to fail, that would be the end of that organism uh, because they cannot replicate if they fail in reproduction. Um, this is because millions of mutants, oh, I already said that, uh, so essentially it would end the lineage. Um, so again, uh, with details and solid proof, if you can answer this question without a shadow of a doubt, then I will accept macroevolution. Uh, again, here's a here's a comparative anatomy of uh, two different organs or two different reproductive systems. On the left, we have a hummingbird, which is extremely complex. Just by looking at it, it looks insane. But when you hear the actual process that the hummingbird goes through while they're actually uh, mating, it's even more insane. And then you have the human system, which we all know that one, so I'm not even going to explain that one. Uh, but again, explain with details how something like that could transition, and then I'll accept macroevolution. Now, in all cases, this cannot be directly observed because the amount of changes required to undergo such changes would be uh, a, would require a very long amount of time. Because this is impossible to observe such large-scale changes, this means that it is not science. The scientific method requires that we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. Uh, so this cannot be observed. That means that macroevolution is nothing but speculation. You don't know how many, <clears throat> you don't know how any of this came to be. Um, so you have to have faith that it did happen at some point in time. Now, another example I will accept as evidence for macroevolution is solid and indisputable proof for abiogenesis. Uh, you claim that you uh, are a chemist. So, I mean, this should be right up your wheelhouse. Explain to me how non-life becomes living life or living material. Uh, evolutionists love to dismiss this as not part of the evolution theory, but it is essential because it is the first and largest leap of the macroevolution process. Um, if you look at the timelines they have, the life had to start somewhere. So in my opinion, that's the first step of macroevolution is getting life in the first place. I'll go ahead and skip all this since uh, you gave three points later on, um, and then we'll just kind of focus on the three points that you mentioned. Um, now, now that I've given some examples of what I will accept as evidence for macroevolution, let's look at some of the current examples given from the evolutionist community. 
as I was making this presentation, I wasn't exactly sure what Lucas wanted to focus on tonight. So I just went through some of his past debates and made my presentation based on that. Um, but last night around 1030, I got an email from Donnie and he said, hey, this is what Lucas wants to talk about. So luckily, I already guessed two of the three topics he wanted to talk about. Um, but the one that I didn't guess was the yellow spotted salamander. And then when I started researching it, I was like, all right, this should be an interesting topic. And then he completely missed the one piece of evidence that he should have addressed as part, as part of proof for evolution. Um, but that's okay. We'll answer both of them. Um, I haven't done too much research on this specific topic, but I did spend, uh, just about all day today studying this. So I'm very fresh on it as far as what I have read. Since we already started talking about the yellow spotted salamander, let's go ahead and start there. Um, I watched parts of the debates where he mentioned this topic, and there's something interesting that I noticed. In his debates that he talks about this, he actually didn't talk about the photosynthesis process. Um, he talked about the egg laying process. He starts by explaining how the yellow spotted salamander gives birth by eggs. But then he immediately goes on to say, others in the species can give live birth and others can do both. So this proves evolution. However, this is obviously a slimy, get it, slimy? Uh, this is obviously a slimy attempt to blur the lines between different kinds of animals in an effort to make it look like we are seeing evolution in action. And I'll explain that in the next slide. Um, in an attempt to save time, I'm not going to go completely down the whole species rabbit hole, uh, but I do want to mention that this is a very slippery word. Um, overall, the point is that this is a man-made classification. So just because two or three animals within the same species have different traits, it doesn't prove a evolutionary transition because you call it the same species as something else doesn't mean that that's what it actually is. Okay. If you want to classify things, we should probably look to the designer that made it and allow him to classify it for us. Um, that goes to the whole argument of oh, is a whale a fish or a mammal? According to the Bible, it's a fish. According to your classification, according to your classification system, it's a uh, mammal. So again, you see how we have this uh, difference in measurement systems. Um, all evolutionists struggle with understanding this because they are so biased in the way that they view science that they intentionally want to ignore this flaw so that they can use it as some sort of rubber ruler to make things look the way they want it to fit. So. Here is a yellow spotted salamander, and there is one thing we can agree on. It's adorable. <laughs> um, and then here is the reproduction process, and this is where I'll kind of go over what you were just talking about. Let me go full screen so that they can actually see this chart a little bit better. Okay, so if we look here in the top left corner, you see the salamander going into the water. And I'm just going to read the step-by-steps and just kind of give a brief overview of this reproduction process. Um, each spring, mature male and female salamanders migrate from the forest, returning to the seasonal vernal pools from which they hatched in order to reproduce. Then we get to this part right here. And uh, once they enter the pool, the males swarm together in a congress. <laughs> That's probably the most productive congress in the world because uh, ours is worthless. Uh, and they await females. While they are waiting, the males exhibit a collective courtship display, wafting pheromones with their tails and nudging receptive females. During this time, the males play sperma, sperma, spermatophores on vegetation in the pool. A receptive female may collect multiple spermatophores in her cloaca to internally fertilize her eggs. Later, she will lay those eggs within the pool. And then this is the part right here that he wanted to use as macroevolution somehow. Um, do I have to go back over the, the definition for you? Macroevolution is changing from one kind to another, or at least seeing the steps in that process. This doesn't show that. In fact, the symbiotic relationship between the salamander eggs and the algae, um, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that name, um, but essentially it's not the salamander using photosynthesis. What happens is the CO2 and waste, um, the, 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 algae using, uh, the algae is inside of this egg and it releases CO2 and eats the waste. Oh, no, I'm sorry, it eats the CO2 and the waste from the developing larva. Then the algae produces oxygen that helps the salamander larva grow. I don't know why it was so hard to read that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so essentially they're just working off of each other. The salamander is still breathing in oxygen that the algae is releasing. The salamander is not actually partaking in the photosynthesis. So that whole argument just crumbled right there. And this is one of your secular charts. Okay. This isn't a creationist chart by any means. 
Uh, and then you get to the fifth stage, it hatches, and then it lives a happy little life until it repeats the process. So let me go ahead and switch back over here. No, I'll go ahead and stay in full screen. That doesn't really matter if they see my face or not. All right, one thing I wanted to emphasize on this cycle is the symbiotic relationship. So what do you know? I guess I did kind of cover it. Um, but what I see when I look at this symbiotic relationship is it obviously screams that there is a creation and a designer. Anytime you see a symbiotic relationship, what that says to me is that someone had to create it. Otherwise, those two things would not be successful because they feed off of each other. So that means that they work in alignment with each other. That's similar to, you know, all the different systems of a car. I know people hate when, you know, creationists mention this kind of argument, but you know, if one of those systems of the car was not there, then the whole car would stop working. So that's a symbiotic relationship to some kind of extent. And it's the same thing here. Anytime you see a symbiotic relationship, you should see a creation and a designer. So Luca uses this as an example of laying the eggs. Um, let me go ahead and get back to my regular side because it's for me to read it this way. All right. So Luca, in his other debates, uses the example of the salamander's uh, egg-laying birth, which is uh, over parody. Uh, then he says that others in this species reproduce by live birth, which would be called viviparity. But there's two obvious problems I see with this at first glance. The first problem is that all of these live births when examined are not exactly the live births that we think of with uh, humans and other mammals. <clears throat> so let me go ahead and define these so you can see the deception in these papers that try and use this specific example as evidence. I was really hoping this was the path you were going to go down because Honestly, if you don't read these papers, this is probably what will trick you into believing macroevolution. But since you uh, didn't go down this, I'm just going to give it to the viewers anyway. Um, oviparity is the process by which the animals lay eggs. Viviparity is the process by which they directly give birth to live young. And then there's a third uh, stage of reproduction. And I'm sorry, not stage, but a third cycle of reproduction, so to say. And this is called ovoviviparity. Ovoviviparous births are animals that still produce eggs within the body until they are ready to hatch. And then they either hatch inside the mother or she releases them still in egg form. And then they hatch almost instantly after they've been released out of the mother. So in all the articles that I read on this topic, um, they never specify which one of these processes they're using. Um, and in fact, if we are actually witnessing ovoviviparity, then the only difference is when the mother chooses to expel the eggs. Um, there's actually one article that I found that specifically said that word for word. Uh, this article right here from Quantum Magazine says egg laying or live birth, how evolution chooses. And here's what they said. That was basically exactly what I just said. The major difference between oviparity and viviparity See how they use viviparity instead of ovoviviparity. Um, therefore, centers on a strategic evolutionary decision. You got to have the sanctimonious tone about when the mother should deposit her embryos. If she deposits them early, she's an egg layer. If she deposits them late, she's a live bearer. But see, they just said if she deposits the eggs late, it's a live bearer. However, that's not what viviparity is. Viviparity is one live minute. birth. Um, so. I'm just going to go ahead and try and close this one out and I'll get to the other two in my next response. But evolutionists love to jump on this and use it to say they are watching evolution in action. But really, we could just be wish witnessing the activation of a built-in genetic trait of these animals' design because there are some that can switch back and forth between these two depending on their environment. The second problem goes back to that word species. Um, nowhere could I find a paper or article that explains this yellow spotted salamander being one of the types of lizards that switches back and forth. Uh, this was um, really evidence. If this was really evidence revolution, then this propaganda would be at the very top of the search results and at the very top of the papers, I guarantee you. Um, however, what I did find is a lot of articles by evolutionists comparing the yellow spotted salamander to other kinds of lizards that, and then saying that they're in the same species. So therefore it's evolution. Again, that shows the whole rubber ruler concept that I was talking about. They need to be able to prove that one kind of animal can turn into another, not one lizard that's you know, different going into another process that might already be built in. And then uh, he mentioned the wheat. This one's like two slides, so I should be able to finish this. The second topic uh, Jamie, if you want to save that maybe for yeah, your rebuttal, we'll That's fine. just because you're already a couple minutes over. Um, okay, yeah. so I appreciate that opening statement and the visuals there, uh, Jamie. Also, uh, to be fair, Luca, if you need an extra minute or so in your rebuttal, 
feel free to do so just to make this as equally timed as possible. So with that, we are now moving yeah. into the rebuttal portions. We've got eight minutes on the clock. And so, Luca, whenever you're ready, yes. the floor is yours. Uh, it's quite interesting because uh, all the beauty parity eating, uh, it's from uh, another thing entirely. Uh, it's a skink, uh, a lizard, and it was not uh, one of my points tonight. But I want to remember that uh, those uh, creatures uh, are developing a placenta. It's not like they are laying the, uh, their eggs laid. They are actually, some of them have a placenta. Uh, so it's a new structure. Uh, it's why it's relevant. On uh, the salamander, uh, the point is quite important because we are uh, looking at something that can be compared just to uh, what chloroplasts are. Basically, what are chloroplasts? Are structure inside a uh, plant cell that uh, procure um, nutrients to the cell uh, doing photosynthesis. It's the same relation we are looking at there. And also, that bacteria uh, do goes uh, inside the cell. That's why important, uh, because we are looking at a process that we uh, till now could just uh, hypothesize, hypothesize from uh, mitochondria and uh, chloroplast. And we do have uh, plenty of evidence of it. As I said, we have a different uh, membrane uh, similar to the bacteria one. Uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts do have uh, the same kind of DNA uh, of bacteria and that's huge evidence for what they are basically ancient uh, bacteria in, in, included inside our cell and that's how we got to our cell uh, it's not like that bacteria and us uh, do not uh, difference. They have a lot. Our difference is uh, the structure. Uh, the, we have a different kind of DNA, completely different. Uh, our DNA is called chromatin. Uh, it's a, it has a different structure. Uh, bacteria uh, have a more simple structure of DNA it's a ring structure, and that's what, what we find inside uh, chloroplasts and mitochondria. So that's quite important, uh, and that's why I want to point that out. That's a very huge thing. It, it's, of course, it's not the salamander doing uh, the photosynthesis, but still, uh, it's an organism inside its cells, like the chloroplast doing basically what a chloroplast does. And I cannot say that um, it's uh, design, because if you want to design something like that, you just need to put a chloroplast inside the salamander. So it does not make any sense. Also, it's not like uh, all population of that salamander has that characteristic. It's developing so just only uh, some uh, some salamanders have it. Uh, so it's a process. We are looking into it right now. On wheat and uh, multicellularity, I want to know uh, the response from Jamie uh, about multicellularity because for what I know, uh, those uh, algae, they remain uh, at the multicellular stage for at least four years. It's not like they change uh, right away. So it's quite a huge change. Less huge than <laughs> the one with the salamander. I remind you that um, those kind of changes are what are needed uh, to differentiate from us and plants we are talking about things of that magnitude. 
on of course uh multicellularity i want to know uh, if the paper is lying because <coughs> either is lying so the paper is wrong or that's a pretty good example of evolution uh, that's a new structure uh, multicellularity is quite a huge thing and on wheat uh, that's an, an important one because that's just a plant right but we are looking at something that is becoming better uh, because it's more resistant as a much bigger genome and that's something new uh, it's a new species uh, of course you can say that species are just uh, us trying to um, describe them uh, the world around us okay but it's still a new plant it's different from the others and i put the images uh, it's quite different more big they it produce far, uh, far more and they it resist better to diseases it's better basically in any way shape or form and you are adding things it's not like the genome is smaller it's much bigger and that's why it's relevant so yeah i want to talk about uh, those kind of things especially on uh, wheat and multicellularity on the skinks uh, the important thing is we are observing new structure uh, a placenta basically uh, and that's in the same species uh skinks with a placenta skink of the same species with something in between so a placenta in uh, in the making and uh, lizards skinks without any placenta and that was not uh, part of my example but we can discuss that if uh, jamie wants Okay, Luca, thanks so much for your eight minute rebuttal. We are now going to hand it to Jamie. Jamie, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours and you also have eight minutes. Jamie, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm uh, gonna go ahead and just reply to a couple things he said and then I'm gonna go back to my presentation. Uh, first, he said that the whole purpose of him mentioning the uh, eggs with the salamander is because it's developing a placenta. Uh, that's actually not true. I'm not sure where you're getting that from because I, all the papers I read, I probably read about five or six different articles today, uh, one of those actually being a peer-reviewed paper. Um, and none of them said anything about new structures. They never mentioned new DNA. They never mentioned something being added in. Um, they all just talked, mostly they all focused on this whole egg process, but we don't have to get into that. We can focus on clammy demonis all you want whenever we get to the open discussion. Um, I'm just pointing out that there was no actual new structures being put in there. You're saying that they're developing placenta, but in fact, this has always been known to be part of the reproduction process. Another thing is you said the bacteria, which it's actually algae, goes inside the cell. And I'm wondering if you mean it goes inside the cell or it goes inside the larva. Uh, because if it goes inside the cell, that's not too much of a big deal. I actually have pictures of what these clumps of uh, baby um, yellow spotted uh, salamander cells look like, I guess you can call them. Um, but I mean, it's not, too, it's not too much of a stretch to say that the algae can clamp, can, you know, go into these larvae and then they go through this whole process of, you know, taking in the waste from the larva and putting out oxygen for them to continue living. Again, that shows design. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into that, but <clears throat> I do want to point out that you did mention that this does not prove that the salamander, you said that the salamanders are not, um, when, or they're not exhibiting photosynthesis. So, I mean, that's kind of the only argument I would see you trying to use with that. I don't understand why else you would bring up that argument. Um, it, neither here nor there. Um, I'm not going to talk about what I wrote down for the clammy demonis and the wheat because I kind of cover it in my presentation. So let's go ahead and get back to the presentation. All right. So as far as the wheat, um, he wants to talk about how icorn wheat or how he says acorn. I'm not sure if I'm saying it wrong or he's saying it with an accent or whatever, but icorn wheat evolving into what we call common wheat today. Uh, when I heard him bring this up in his last debate, I, I got to be honest, I thought it was hilarious um, because this argument is, 
it falls on its face for one main reason. Um, Einkorn and common wheat are both wheat. Okay. I want to just reiterate that one more time. It's still the same thing. Um, here's the comparison of them. I mean, look how similar they are. Icorn wheat looks almost identical to common wheat. Uh, Icorn and common wheat can both be bought in the store in bags, and then they can both be used to make bread, flour, pasta, etc. They're the exact same thing. So what you're saying with all these hundreds of transitions and you know mixing in these other plant breeds, all you did was just make the same thing a little bit better. That doesn't prove macroevolution. Um, you tried to use the argument for the chromosome count and the production amount. Yeah, that's part of artificial selection. Again, it's still wheat. It never left being wheat. Macroevolution is the change from one kind to another. So if you're trying to use wheat plus wheat equals wheat, that doesn't prove macroevolution. That's just microevolution, which no one argues microevolution. In fact, it shouldn't even be called that. It should be called something around the lines of you know, variations or something, because that's all it really is. They just use that term as a free rider effect for every other stage of the evolution um, religion. So at most, this can be can classified as microevolution. We already said that. Uh, evolution that results in adding new and large complex changes to an organism, that's what macroevolution is. I would expect Luca to know the difference between micro and macroevolution since he's a chemist and a teacher that teaches science. Um, so, I mean, hopefully you'll correct that and you won't use this as an argument again, because it really doesn't prove anything in my opinion. Um, the second thing he mentioned in this debate with Kent that I was watching, uh, was the clammy demonis and the whole talking point of single cell to multicellular. Um, I did just do a two and a half hour debate on this topic. So I was expecting him to bring up a lot more of those talking points, but he didn't. And I think the reason why is because it's very easy to see through the deceptive wording that snake was using throughout that whole debate. And actually that's what the rest of this presentation is. It's just me kind of breaking down that deceptive wording. Um, I suspected this is why Luca wanted to debate me in the first place, since he uh, loves to mention this topic in just about all of his debates. So I kind of made this the main focal point of my uh, presentation. Uh, maybe Luca will give me some uh, new talking points that I can add to my presentation before I move to the recording phase because I'm actually in the process of putting together a uh, documentary style presentation on Clammy Demonis. It just seems like that's what I've been called to do for some reason. Um, as far as the claims I've heard so far from the papers and the snake debate, it didn't take too much research to find uh, easy answers to these questions. So let's go ahead and look at the single cell to multicellular argument. Uh, from my studies, I've noticed that evolutionists have a very specific way that they want to define multicellularity. So first we will look at their, de their definition and dissect that, um, and then we'll go through an accurate definition that also is from non-creationist secular sources of science. <clears throat> so first let's look at how they want to define, and this is straight from Snake's slides in his debate that I was at. Uh, he said that the way you define multicellularity cellularity is increase in size, cell differentiation, and functional organization of space. Uh, but this is quite vague, and there are a few reasons why these characteristics um, don't really uh, pertain to clammy demonis being multicellular. The first point I want to make is that an increase in size alone does not mean anything. Uh, we see these organisms increase in size all the time, and they never change into anything else. Uh, so that alone doesn't mean anything, but I mean, if you add it up with other factors, it could. Um, now, not to mention that one single clammy demonis can reproduce up to 64 daughter cells in normal asexual and sexual reproduction conditions. So to see a cluster or a colony, which he's going to swear up and down, that's not what it is. Um, to see a cluster or colony extend beyond that is not unimaginable and it's not novel results. Um, for those that argue that this isn't a cluster or a colony, I will address that in just a moment. The second point I want to make is uh, actually two part. It's dissecting the claim that we have witness cell differentiation. And then um, the this cell differentiation proves evolution from single cell to multi-cell. So this is cell differentiation. Okay, a stem cell turns into a muscle cell or it turns into a fat cell or it turns, turns into a bone cell or a blood cell, sorry, or an immune cell, so on and so forth. This is not 
cell differentiation. Okay. One the minute. fact that the fact that some of them choose to be motile and germline and some choose not to be motile and somatic doesn't prove that it's cell differentiation. Now, what's interesting about cell differentiation is it's a, if you look at an actual definition of this from people who aren't just trying to push evolution, what they're going to say is this is the process in which a cell alters from one type of cell into a different one with a specialized function. That's the key word here, specialized function, because that means that it has a new design that it did not previously have before the differentiation. So if we go back to that picture and we see that now some are motile and some are germline, and then others are non-motile and somatic, those aren't new features. They just turned off pre-existing features. Um, this definition is taken from a combination of secular sources, not creationist sources. Uh, this is a more accurate and non-biased definition of the term. So we're not taking the evolutionist definition, and we're not taking the creationist evolution uh, definition. We're taking a definition from scientists that are that have yet to show in their papers that they lean either way. Um, so we got 15 seconds. I'll go ahead and stop there. And um, if he wants more of this presentation, uh, we can do that in the open discussion because there's a lot more that we didn't even start to cover. Okay, Jamie, thanks so much for that eight-minute rebuttal. That concludes the opening statements and the uh, rebuttal around of the debate. So now we are moving into everybody's favorite part of a debate, the discussion portion. So rather than a strict cross-exam, what we're going to do here is keep it more free-flowing and organic uh, in, the, in the form of more of a conversation. So uh, Jamie, he did just uh, end with his rebuttal. So Luca, why don't we hand it over to you and, yes. and allow you to pick the first point that you want to discuss. So go ahead, gentlemen. Yes, uh, I will. I'm quite uh, stunned uh, because uh, <laughs> on the wheat, uh, we have a huge difference uh, here. We have, you said two things, uh, more production and uh, more uh, genome, uh, basically chromosome uh, mm -hmm. content. Yes, but it's not just that. We have three entire genomes of three different plants inside it. And I did uh, provide another point that this is uh, resistance. Uh, it's a huge thing to maintain the survivability of the plant. Also, uh, yes, they look similar, but wheat, uh, modern wheat is much more big. It produces uh, three, four times more. Uh, just think about it in uh, animal terms, a uh, cow that can produce three, four uh, times uh, the meat. It's a completely different organism. And we do have three entire genome inside it. And we can reproduce that. So it's not uh, a little change. It's quite huge. It's more <coughs> like to survive uh, to the certain diseases. It produces more, and that's quite important. And it's more uh, resistant uh, on the whole spectrum. So. so I don't understand how I can get you to understand this, um, but you're saying that you use these strains of other plants to make it live longer, to make it produce more. But again, at the end of the day, it is still wheat. It never became anything other than wheat. It's still used the same way. It still looks the same way. It's harvested the same way. It's grown the same way. So again, that, that's not macroevolution. Macroevolution, like I said in the beginning with the, with the examples I will accept, um, you know, from gills breathing through the water to lungs breathing direct air. That is an example of macroevolution. What you're talking about is microevolution because your wheat, after all of this crossbreeding and artificial selection, has still become wheat. <laughs> There's nothing else there. Just uh, to put it in uh, perspective, just think about us uh, interbreeding, basically, like that, that plant, of course, uh, we do not function like that. Plants are mo much more resilient than us. <clears throat> but let's take uh, us and chimps. Mm -hmm. You put uh, both our genomes together and you get a human, uh, smart as a human, and with the same muscle density of a chimp. You will be have, uh, a small change, 
I do not think so. And you have that with three plants, not just one. Three plants. I mean, but still at the end of the day, let's say you mix the human and the chimp, right? And then you get more hair. Well, the human already had hair. That's not something new. We're looking for macroevolution. You need a new and complex change. And that's why I showed the examples at the beginning because you're not showing new changes. You're, you're showing what would be considered maybe improved changes to what we want from, from the plant. Cause obviously we want the plant to survive in more environments so that we can grow more of it. And we want more production so that we can sell more of it or eat more of it. Um, but the thing is, it's not leaving that stage. There's nothing new about it. It's still the same thing. Uh, I don't know how else I can say this so that you can understand what I'm telling you because it's still wheat. It's still doing the same thing. We're still using it the same way. Show me what's new about it. I mean, is it like now that wheat can, now that wheat can walk away with its legs? I mean, can that wheat talk to us now or can it play the saxophone or something? Like what's new about it? It's still wheat. It's a wheat that can produce <coughs> three times more food. That's quite big. Right. Just so I think we're just going to keep going in circles on that one. On, uh, an animal that will be a huge change. That's new. It's not the same. And if you want to look uh, at some difference in uh, structure, you can look at uh, the mice, as someone was saying in the shot. That's you have new structure. The corn structure is completely a different thing from uh, Tiosinta. That's new if you want to do that something different. But even with, yes, it looks similar. But if you look at the plant, and I did, it's quite different. There are some huge differences inside the plant. It's not like we do not have changes. We do have it, and they are quite huge. All right, so it looks like we're just going to keep circling around on this one. Um, I don't think we're going to get anywhere as far as that one goes. So do you want to go to the salamander or the... Um, Gladly. Uh, as I said, uh, the process the salamander is going through, uh, first of all, uh, the skink and the salamander, two completely different topics. We are not talking about oviparity on the salamander. It's not like it's doing it. Uh, the skink is another completely different creature. Yeah, we can completely disregard the whole reproduction process. I just thought that was the approach. No, 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 we, we can discuss it, it so that's fine. Uh, but it's not the salamander. It's a skink. Uh, it's right. a different animal. Completely. Yeah, as far as the photosynthesis, uh, explain to me why you think that proves macroevolution. Well, we have a creature that now can uh, use uh, a an algae, yes, I did that wrong, to basically use photosynthesis is what plants are doing with the chloroplast. What's the difference? So, okay, by, okay, so let me just take that for a second. So by, by the statement you just made, if I eat a plant that uses photosynthesis to, to grow, does that mean that I am now partaking in photosynthesis? Because that's essentially what you just said to me. Because that's all the, the that's will all the not go inside your cell if something like that happened would be a huge thing, and that's what's happening with the, the salamander. The algae is inside the cell and is producing uh, the products of uh, photosynthesis inside the cell. Okay, it's so I'm glad you mentioned that. That was a question with I the had chloroplast. Too. That's insanely huge. Because so that's the, that's another question evidence, I had. Sorry, it's evidence for the process to the making of mitochondria and chloroplast. It's really really huge. Okay, so you said that the algae goes inside the cell. Are you talking about the the egg, or are you talking about the actual salamander larva? The egg. Uh, okay, so that's what I wanted. The first so let me pull. Pull up this right. No, no, no. We Let's are talking here. about the cells not, of the salamander. Watch the whole thing. I show this picture right here. Yeah, because this right here is the clump of eggs of salamanders. Okay, I'll full screen my screen right quick so that you can just. Here, it's easier if I do it this way. 
I don't care if people can see my face. So this is the eggs, okay? It's just a, it's basically just a clump of um, uh, a cellular matrix for the most part. And then inside of that is a whole bunch of different little yellow spotted salamander egg or larvas. So the fact that the the fact that the um, the algae is going into that it does not it, that's not I don't see why that's so impressive to you because it's literally just a blob. <laughs> that's what this extracellular matrix is, just a blob that has a whole bunch of larvas inside of it. And if there's if there's algae just floating around in that. I mean, why does that prove macroevolution? That's what I'm trying to understand from you because I just don't understand why you think that's macroevolution. Maybe there is <coughs> a misunderstanding. We are not talking about something inside the matrix. We are talking about something inside the cells of the salamander. As you getting inside your cells a chloroplast, you will become uh, able to do photosynthesis in that case. That's that's huge that's incredible it's groundbreaking it's okay so incredible. you are retracting your statement and you're saying that these algae are going inside of the larva themselves then because yes inside the cell of the salamander it's okay the so so from what i've read i've read about four different papers in regards to this symbiotic relationship well i wouldn't say papers i'll say articles because it's not exactly okay. peer-reviewed papers they're just articles um but from what I've read, they don't go inside of the salamander. They just go inside of the quote unquote eggs of the salamander. And then while they're inside of those eggs, they are eating the CO2 and the waste of the salamander. You have to be outside of the salamander to eat its waste because it's pooping and peeing. And then this, the algae are eating that. And then what they do is they take the CO2 and the waste of the salamander babies and they turn that into oxygen, and then the salamander breathes that in. So in order for that whole process to be functioning, the, the algae is outside of the salamander. I've never it's seen inside. one of these papers that says it's inside of the salamander. So you have to send me that, and let me break that one down, because I'm sure that'll be just as easy to break down as the whole ovo viva parody argument. I will, but the uh, I get it's inside the cell. It's why it's that huge, and that's macroevolution for sure. And okay, so huge. if you were to, if you were to take some medicine, and then the medicine that you took fought off a disease or a virus or a sickness inside of your body, does that mean that the medicine has become a part of you? Well, no. But if you <laughs> have chloroplast inside yourself, you are becoming basically X Men. So okay, all right. So I guess we've uh, kind and of covered that's, everything that's we're going to cover on that one. That paper is that huge. Is the only vertebrate uh, able to do the, this. It's huge. And it's not microevolution because it's something becoming uh, photosynthetic and a vertebrate nonetheless. Right, I think I've shown pretty well that this is not photosynthetic. Um, but see, this is, this is what I like. I always tell evolutionists this, you know. Um, it's like you're taking a three-dimensional ball, you're calling it a circle, and then rejecting anything that goes outside of the two-dimensional definition you put on it. Because you're, because you're so desperate to find evidence for evolution, you're not letting the evidence speak for itself. You're trying to interpret it in a way that you want to see it. Because every article I read, not a single one of them said that it goes inside of the salamander. Now, you may have a paper that you're going to send to me after this debate, and I'll read it, and, I'll, and you know, if that's right, then okay. But even then, that would be the same concept as you know me taking medicine, and then apparently that medicine becomes a part of me, and now I'm x man you know what I mean? It's the exact same thing. You're, you're, you're making this flat image and you're not allowing the data to represent itself because when you do that, people will clearly see that that's not what's happening here. The, the salamander is not photosynthetic. And you actually said that at the beginning, or you actually said that in the, in the, uh, in your response, after I asked you that question, I wrote it down as you were responding you said clammy. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> not the wrong one. You said I said that the salamander were is not doing the photosynthesis. They were inside the cells, so yes, they are photosynthetic. 
Okay, it's so wild. now you're going back and forth on yourself. So if people go back and listen to your eight minute rebuttal, they will hear you say that the salamander is not commit is not doing the photosynthesis. The algae is doing the photosynthesis. So therefore, that's the same thing as saying I'm not fighting off the the flu inside of my body. The medicine that I'm taking is fighting off the flu inside of my body. So I think we've kind of covered most of everything in regards to I'm that. I'm uh, curious about one thing. So okay. how do we explain uh, the difference between uh, the DNA inside a mitochondria or a chloroplast and our DNA from inside our cells, chromatin and ring DNA? Uh, so I'll be honest, when it comes to DNA, I'm not too familiar on that. So I probably won't be able to give you the best definition, but I'm not quite sure why you're asking that though. How does that pertain to these discussions? Because as I said, uh, that's evidence for the origin of mitochondria and chloroplast. And they are basically much, much more like uh, bacteria than uh, our DNA. Basically, they are bacteria inside our cells doing things. Okay, Same yeah, so structure <laughs> of the um, membrane, uh, same kind of DNA, and that's completely different from chromatin, our kind of DNA that's completely different much more simple like a bacteria and why we have that so it sounds like you're starting to skate into the whole erv type of conversation where it's like oh there's viruses inside of us and you know why are they in there that's bad design so on and so forth no 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 that's, that's a like completely different thing i mean that's what it sounds like you're saying because you're saying why do we have viruses and bacteria inside no. of our body Right? That's what you just asked. Okay, uh, so. What I'm telling you that uh, mitochondria and chloroplast are, I have characteristics that are much, much alike bacteria. Why you have something like that inside your body? Right. It's well, not because it serves a function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of the design is it serves a function in that design. Um, Why again, not that was chromatin? It's much uh, better option. It works. You know, I, I love when people bring up this argument of why don't they do it this way? Why wouldn't the designer do it this way? Because this would be a better design. That's kind of like when I heard the uh, first for the first time, I heard that argument about uh, octopus eyes are better than human eyes because of the way that they're designed. Our, our eyes are designed backwards. And then we come to find out less than a year later from that statement that the reason they're designed that way is because they're inside of water and they see better that way. And they don't have to worry about the UV rays like our eyes do. So see, whenever you say these arguments of why don't they design it this way instead, I would actually like to challenge you to create life, like abiogenesis, go do it, and then design it how you want and see if it's better than God's design. You know, they get to, they got to basically protocells from uh, chemicals. Yeah, that's not accurate. They actually didn't even make yeah, the first... Did. So in order for you to create life from abiogenesis, you have to have all 20 amino acids. They could not get all 20. They could act, they actually got less than 10 of the amino acids. And the environment that they used to create those amino acids was a oxygen-free environment. So once the life is created somehow from this half of the amino acids needed to build life, because you have to have 20 amino acids to build proteins, so once they do actually create the life, it now has no oxygen to breathe. And in fact, instead of not just did it not have oxygen, but instead of not having oxygen, it was in a methane ammonia environment, which would literally kill it before it could even start to live. So we can see with this whole abiogenesis thing that it their, their, their whole experiments failed horribly. So that's why I say if you think that God's such a bad designer – Go in the lab, create life, and show me how much better a human can do it. Yes, we have an example from David Dreamer with uh, these uh, scientists starting from chemicals uh, and getting to protocells, able to do gene expression and to reproduce, basically divide themselves. That's quite huge. And that was from chemicals. They were not alive, of course. And he got something that was kind of alive. 
So I would actually love to challenge you because you're a chem you're a chemist, right? Mm -hmm. So I would actually love to challenge you to an abiogenesis debate, but I want you to provide two or three papers and we just talk about those two or three papers because I'm not that familiar on chemistry and I'm actually not that good with chemistry. I however, really if you, however, if you give me, let's say we choose three papers and you give me enough time to research all three of those papers and that's the only part of this debate we talk, that's, that's what we focus the whole debate on is those three papers. We can call it, you know, uh, instead of a book club, it'll be a journal club, right? If we were to do that, I guarantee you I can find the flaws in all of these abiogenesis arguments that you're making. Uh, because the the most the most famous uh, experiment that was done in, as far as abiogenesis goes is the Miller Urey experiment, and that went on for generations. Like even after Urey died, Miller continued his experiments, and Miller did I think seven hundred different variations before he finally got eight amino acids. And again, you have to have two hundred amino acids to start making proteins. So you have to have these 200 different amino acids to start making the proteins. So therefore, in 70 different variations or 700 different variations, I can't remember the exact number, he still didn't even get halfway. So I'd love to see what you're talking about as far as we can make life because I've, I, have not, I have yet to see it in any experiments. Well, I can assure you that science uh, went a long way uh, from uh, military unit experiment and right now we are much uh, more knowledgeable about uh, those topics we know much more about uh, how the uh, catalytic reaction and things like that and we did some experiment and what i love of david dreamer about his work it's that he's doing his job uh, outside he's doing it in nature to better reproduce uh, the environment and is getting a good results and i would love to share those paper and have a discussion with you uh, on those topics but trust me uh, miller yuri uh, it was a somewhat uh, good experiments for that time but we are way past that right now well you know the jury will be out on that one we'll have to come back for a round two as far as that one goes uh now did you want to see my talking points on clammy demonis and then you can kind of just respond to those? I would love to. all right so i guess let's say you know i'll do i'll read through like two or three slides make one point and then i'll allow you to respond to that point and we'll just see how far that takes us sound good okay yes. so let me go ahead and just um pulling myself you, don't have to pull. Uh, you should be able to read it from that little um, oh, or that too. Okay. All right. So we talked about the definition of multicellularity as far as how the evolutionists want to coin it. That would be just kind of go back right quick. Increase in size, cell differentiation, functional organization of space. So I'm just going to kind of breeze through those three. Um, uh, we, that's where we left off. So the second point I wanted to make is actually two part, the whole differentiation we did that. Okay. So this definition is taken from a combination of secular sources. All of these sources appear to mention nothing on either creation or evolution. So this is a more accurate and non-biased definition of the term. The specialized function definition, not the three criteria that snake gave. So the purpose of differentiation as far as, you know, as far as it becoming multicellular would mean that it would have to start creating specialized functions, which it did not. All that was witnessed in these experiments is artificial selection that took cells prone to aggregation because what they did is they selected cells that were the single cell algae. They selected ones that were more likely to go through aggregation and they basically encouraged them to form generational colonies that consist of daughter cells. Furthermore, the single cells within those colonies are being assigned roles that were already pre-existing in the DNA code. Before the experiment, the single cells already had the ability to be both motile and germline. After the, after the experiment, roughly half of them stopped being motile and the other half stopped the germline function. So if these results proved anything, it's that mutations throughout generations will only cause a loss of function. With that being said, these results really fit the predictions made within the creation science model and is contradictory to evolution because in order for something to evolve, it needs to gain function, not lose function. 
I think that's a pretty good point to start with, and uh, we'll go ahead and let you talk about that one now. Yes, uh, I would love to know uh, if you have uh, an organism that create cluster of, for the most part, eight cells, and uh, every time uh, it produces uh, propagules, uh, single cells, one, that once they go away from the mother uh, body, basically, they also start to reproduce and they get to eight cell formation and they continue up to 64 uh, they continue to do so for four years straight that's not a multicellular uh, organism so you're saying that these experiments are not showing a multicellular organism yes okay Eight well that's are multicellular. all right so then you just you know, basically proved my entire argument that I've been making on claiming demonis. It does not prove multicellularity. It's just colonies that are, that are, they've been artificially selected in the lab to do this. That's, that's all they are. And I'm glad that someone admits that. If you have a uh, eight cell, that's a multicellular organism. But it's, it's not eight. It's not one cell that has it's not one organism that has eight cells it's eight single cells that are living together this would no, be similar all those no 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 let me explain one thing those cells are all daughters from the single propagule so that's only one organism if you have more cells coming together that's a cluster that's uh, a colony that's so it's funny that you mentioned that because that's actually somewhere in my presentation. Um, and that goes back to my whole rubber ruler thing that, you know, you want it to fit this definition so bad that you're putting these, these limitations on it that don't make sense. So these eight cells, let's, let's go back to the uh, analogy that I used in my last debate. Let's say that I have eight children and they all decide to still live in my house when they grow up and we work together to pay the bills. We are still eight individual people. We did not become one person. That is a that is a colony would be the best definition of that. Um, but then um, if one of them decides to go off and have their own kids, well now and they do the same thing, they're still separate people. Like it never it never became one single person. So I think what would really clear that up is if we just go over the non-biased definition of this. So let's go ahead and Sorry, skip. This. On your definition, how can you tell that's uh, a multicellular organism? Because and that's, that's what I'm getting to right now. Uh, uh, repro and then, is reproducing and getting to the size of eight cell clusters, and the, it remained that way for four years straight, continuing to reproduce and getting to the same size. That's an organism. That's not a colony. A colony can grow, depends on the condition but okay. they are so, single cells coming together but still even a colony it's an intermediate step to multicellularity i mean if you want to call it that sure go ahead um but let's look at a definition of multicellularity what defines multicellularity from someone who has neither decided to lean on evolution or lean on creation so this is a non-biased definition and the characteristics he listed for that and this is actually this actually comes from a professor that makes articles on studying organisms in i think botany or microbiology um, and people go there to like take notes for their tests and whatnot so this is a pretty official source uh, multicellularity is organisms that are developed by cellular specialization that's the key word specialization and division of labor each cell becomes efficient in a single process and becomes dependent on the other cells to work in coordination for the proper functioning of the organism. At first glance, the evolutionists can try and take this, this paragraph, this little section right here. At first glance, they can try and take that and say, well, that's exactly what we see in these, in these experiments. But no, that's not exactly true because here's what he listed as the characteristics of multicellularity. He said, one, they make more or they are made of more than one cell. Obviously, multicellularity it has to be made of more than one cell. The second thing he said is they contain a membrane bound structure, which I can agree that your experiment shows that. But again, I would argue that it's a colony because of the next three characteristics that's missing. Uh, the third characteristic is they have specialized systems for each cell. 
these cells did not create specialized systems. The DNA was exactly the same before and after the experiment. The functions were exactly the same before and after. The only difference was some stopped having one function and others stopped having the other function so that they could work together and, and they could um, essentially – um, they would work together and one group would focus on this function, which was motility, and the other group would focus on germline, which is reproduction. So they didn't have specialized systems. Specialized systems would be sort of how when we see uh, the lungs take oxygen and put that into the blood. The heart pumps blood throughout the body. The liver cleans all the toxins out of our body. You see, those are specialized functions. Those are things that that one organ, that one part of the body has that other parts cannot do. That's what specialized means is that unless that one thing is there, the other part of the, the other parts of the organism will not be able to do that. Uh, the fourth characteristic he had was they are visible to the naked eye. And this one I put an X on, but it could go both ways because if the colony is big enough, it is visible to the eye, to the naked eye. However, if it's a small colony of eight, it's more than likely not going to be visible because they are pretty small. Um, however, I don't really agree with that one too much, so we could really just take that one off the list. Uh, number five was they have distinct organs or differences in cells. Now, these cells inside of the what I would call a colony, they were identical. They just had some focusing on reproduction and some focusing on motility. There was no real difference inside of the structure of them, and they never formed any kind of organs which would be special which would be, you know, something that does a specialized feature. As far as I will give you this, they do exhibit division of labor, but it's labor that both that both of them could have done. They just assigned roles to certain ones. And then their size increases with the number of cells. So <clears throat> you're missing the most important parts of the characteristics. You're missing the specialized systems and you're missing <coughs> distinct organs and differences in cells. But rock pebbles are specialized to reproduction. So we already see that division. And also what kind of organs you want to see in a cluster of cell of eight cells much uh, of uh, the multicellular organisms are too little to be seen uh, by the eye and of course depends of on the numbers of cells it's not like we are talking about something like that us mm. we are talking about something much much smaller but propagules are already specialized cells mm -hmm. used to reproduction So you're saying because they're small, they can't have systems, right? They can't, they can't have specialized systems. That's With what eight you said. cells, you cannot have organs as we think uh, about. Uh, well, see, the thing life. is, it's not just eight. From what I understand, it could go up to 100 according to what the uni de multi art pa peer review paper said. But neither here nor there, the size doesn't matter because – One of the smallest organisms in the world is the tardigrade. And the tardigrade has a breathing system. The tardigrade has a muscle system. The tardigrade has a nervous system. It and that's smaller than – I think it might be smaller than Clammy Demonis if I'm not mistaken. I mean I'm not going to say that as a fact, but that's a small organism that has multiple systems. So again, I don't think size really matters as far as why – as as an excuse for you to say they don't need specialized systems that's what makes a multicellular organism is the specialized systems so your your experiments i understand that you see something developing that might you know be something in the future but until you get specialized systems or differences within the cells like dramatic differences within the cells not just functions turning on and off until you get that It's not a multicellular organism, and you just need to take down those papers, which you're not going to do because you didn't write them, but still. As I said, propagules are specialized to reproduction, and also the cells, as someone, Grayson, was saying in the chat, uh, are specialized because they are made to come together and stay uh, together. So they are specialized. So so you're, so I, what you're doing is you're trying to use specialized, You're trying to say they're specialized because they've assigned roles to each other. But here's the thing. Before that experiment, a single cell clamidomonas that didn't go into a cluster or a colony could do all of those functions on its own. 
It didn't need to go into a cluster to do this. There was single cell clamidomonas that lived perfectly fine and had both motility and germline. So that's what I'm saying is that you're trying to say because they've assigned roles to each other that now it's multicellular because that's specialized. That's not specialized systems because before that they all could do that. And in fact, it's actually more harmful to these single cells because what we see is now they have become, I think you said that whenever they tried to cut them apart, they couldn't survive alone anymore. And that's because they have gotten used to this process of assigning roles. So just because they have assigned roles, that doesn't mean, yeah, I know you're like, oh, that's multicellularity, but that's not multicellularity because they're still single cells. And when I read the paper that you're talking about, the de novo paper, uh, they said that for four years they stayed inside the clusters. But then if you continue reading, it says in a laboratory controlled environment. What happens when we put this back into the wild? I guarantee you if they didn't omit that and they actually did that part of the research, we would find that over time they would go back to their single cell phases, which they were perfectly fine with before your experiment. Your experiment, or I'm sorry, it's not your experiment, but the experiment that you like to advertise, um, it's just showing a loss of information and a reliability on colonies to survive. Yes, and why uh, the same uh, algae in the same lab settings and they do not uh, produce cluster like that, the uh, control uh, populations, mm -hmm. they do not uh, create uh, those clusters, they stay multi uh, monocellular. We have some that they do now form those cluster of the same size you said uh, 100 cells i never uh, read anything like that for what uh, i can understand the more common um, size is eight cells clusters so why why the the control ones are not uh, showing that and the other yeah, they do. Well, I think because the experiments you're referring to are the ones about predation, correct? So that's why, because they're under harsh environments or they're under a threat from their environment. And we see that. So um, if we were to make it all the way through my presentation, there's a part where it talks about this cluster that we go through or the cluster that we're watching them go through. And this is not just happening in the lab. This is how the Clamidomonas survive in polar regions. There's a Clamidomonas nivalis, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, N-I-V-A-L-I-S, Clamidomonas nivalis. Go do some research on that one because it lives in clusters, but it is still classified as a single-celled organism. So it's doing the exact same thing that your experiment is doing, but they're not calling it a they're not calling it a multicellular organism because it's long been known that this is just one of its functions of survival. And what's really interesting about that is it's actually red because of the lack of sun in, in the polar environments. So again, the, what you're showing in your experiment, that's not novel. Okay. We've seen that in the wild, in the polar regions, algae. And um, I would love to see how your, how the people that wrote your papers respond to that are they purposely ignoring the clamidomonas nivalis because it didn't take me long to find it and i don't even have a degree so why are they why are they not talking about it so we have an organism that have more cells that if uh, you separate those cells it dies it reproduce uh, with propagules that are a specialized structure and they uh, divide to the same size, basically, uh, eight uh, cell clusters, but that's not a multicellular organism. Actually, I cannot uh, understand. Yes, I can understand because, uh, sorry if I say that, but if you admit uh, that kind of change, uh, evolution is pretty evident. So I can understand that, but uh, that's completely beside me because something that if you uh, 
uh, separ uh, the organism dies uh, with specialized structure uh, propagates and the cells uh, componing uh, the the organism they are held together in a certain way uh, so they are specialized are different from the other uh, chlamydomas uh, so yeah for me that's multicellularity it's, uh, I mean, I if can... you want to believe that's multicellularity, then by all means, believe whatever you want. But until it me reaches the final stages of multicellularity and it actually meets all of those criteria, until it meets those, don't call it science. Okay, just call it your belief. I mean, just to be you... sure where you did find those criteria, because I can tell that at least one is not accurate at all because. It's uh, not like all multicellular organisms are uh, so big that you can see with naked eye. Far from right. And that's so, why I said that's I, I actually said that. I said we can honestly remove that one because I yes, don't fully agree so with that where one. Where you, you did find that because but one is wrong. This is, uh, let me see, I actually can probably pull it up. I believe it was bygus, B Y G U S dot com slash study slash micro or slash multicellularity and this is a website that is uh it uses source material for college students to study with for their papers and it's approved by the schools the whole reason i know about by just.com is because when i was at lone star community college that's the website they recommended us go to for our source material when we were writing papers so, I mean, as much as I don't agree with that one about the naked eye because the tardigrades multicellular and it's not visible to the naked eye, as much as I don't agree with that one, there's still two important characteristics in that list that your clammy demonis don't meet up to. And that's the specialized systems and the distinct organs or differences of cells. Now, I know you want to say they're specialized systems, but they're not. They're assigned functions. Because remember, the single cell version, as you want to call it, the single cell version in your eyes, has the ability to be motile and germline. So now that they're in these clusters and one of them is motile and one of them is germline, now you're saying they're specialized. That's not specialized. That's assigned because they already had that built into the DNA. Specialized, a new, a novel specialized system would mean something new in the DNA, a new characteristic is being added to one of these specific cells, which we just don't see. We see what um, I think uh, Donnie likes to use the term front loaded, uh, front loaded programming. I think that's the term he likes to use. And that's essentially where these features can be turned on and off depending on the environment, depending on uh, necessity for survival or necessi necessity for survival. But that's what, it, that's what we're witnessing. We're witnessing them turning on and off their already existing functions. Yes, you know, but when you present me to a list where uh, the 11, 12% of what uh, is saying is wrong, uh, it makes me quite skeptic. If, uh, well, I I'm skeptic about a lot honest. of things you guys post and you still preach it in all the schools. Yes, so, I mean, I'm your skepticism is it's regardless. Not like I'm uh, uh, talking about evolution with my st students. Uh, also, I think that such a thing in elementary school is done uh, by history books. I uh, do not agree with that, but it's like that. I just want to say, because I look down at the live chat, and I see that uh, Grayson is in the live chat. It's nice to see you, Grayson. That's probably my favorite critic. <laughs> so, um, Donnie, well, I'm, I'm calling out Grayson. Grayson I'm not is schedule a debate. quite knowledgeable. Well, I was saying, you know, Grayson's another one of those evolutionists that is a blessing because he's willing to engage in debate. Yeah. So people like Grayson, Preston, Ryan Adler, Luca, mm -hmm. I'm going to keep you gentlemen very busy doing debate <laughs> for 2023. So yeah. get ready. Um, I was just so, about to put... Yeah. Maybe I was that just could about be my next debate this. with Grayson. Yeah. We're going to get you and uh, Grace in a debate. I was saying that in the live chat, Grayson versus <laughs> Jamie 2023. Yeah. So we're going to make it happen. Yeah. I was just about to put this on the screen, two minutes left. So I don't know if you guys had two more minutes worth of content that you wanted to get out just to make sure you left no stone unturned, or we could jump immediately into closing statements. It's up to you guys.
Amy? I mean, we can just go straight into the closing statement. So let's go ahead and do it. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> let's do this, guys. So we got five minutes on the clock for closing statements. This way you can wrap up your thoughts, wrap up your points, leave no stone unturned, and basically feel like you've had enough time to uh, say what you need to say. So, Luca, since you were in the affirmative today, let, um, yes. let's give you the floor for the first five-minute uh, closing statement. And whenever you're ready, Luca. As I explained, uh, there are quite uh, some good evidence for uh, macroevolution, and I would love to for Jamie to respond to things like uh, the salamander because, for what uh, I know, the relationship with the algae is inside the cell, and that's why it's that important. And I cannot say see how that's not macroevolution. Uh, wheat, I disagree completely because that plant is better, uh, it's adding material. Uh, I think that uh, no creationist will uh, define uh, that process losing information in any kind of way. And once you get new information, you get new things, a new plant, a better one, you have evolution. And also, uh, something that I did not say for the entire of the debate, the definition of uh, macroevolution, for what I know, is anything uh, beyond uh, the level of species. And that's macroevolution. It's not like new structure or things like that. Once you get a new species, so a uh, population that do not longer interbreed for various reasons, you get macroevolution. So, yeah, I would love to have another discussion with Jamie on abiogenesis. I think that there is a lot to say on that because David Dreamer has done a lot of work and is not the only one, but <laughs> that was a good one. Uh, and I would love to discuss uh, that kind of things because let's face it uh the results of his experiments are quite groundbreaking uh the salamander is another thing that i think is groundbreaking but i think that all the example given today were good ones and i want the people in the chat to look into those things uh, i do not want to convert you or shake your fate but just be curious and i close there luca thank you so much for that five minute closing statement gentlemen i gotta say the discussion portion was very interesting engaging these are some really interesting topics so especially moving into 2023 i want to have more debates like this where we take a few points and just really dig deep in terms of engaging them so thanks for a great discussion Jamie, you do have your five-minute closing statement, so let me hand it to you now. And whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Yeah, so for my closing statements, I'm going to kind of give you all a left turn. Um, I don't do this because I want to be right and I want you to be wrong. For all the evolutionists listening, the reason I do this is because I once believed in evolution and the life without God is no life at all. Okay. You think you're happy. You think you're free. You think that because you're not adhering to God's rules that you get to do whatever you want. But the thing is the things that God is telling you not to do, the reason he's telling you not to do that is because you are in bondage to those sins. You think you're free, but you're really enslaved. It's not until you accept Jesus Christ as your savior that you are truly free. So that's why I do this, because evolution has been used as the number one tool to pull people away from God and make them live this hollow life that they they just don't they think that they have this freedom and they think that they have the, the all these opportunities because of these the, the lifting of God's laws. But that's not what it is at all. OK, I guarantee you, if you give God a chance, he will change your life and you will see true worth in life for once that's i see in the world all the time that there's so much depression there's so much anger and hatred between people and all of that would be cured if we just listened to our creator 
So the reason I do these debates is to help people open their eyes to the deception they've been tricked into believing and considering the possibility of going back to the creator because the creator is the designer of the universe and his remarkable design can be applied to your life. Jesus Christ died for your sins and he wants to give you a true purpose in life. That's why I do this. So for everyone out there, I'm praying that you either use this message as a way to motivate you to go preach to others if you're already saved. And if you're not saved, I pray you use this message to just give God a chance. You don't have to immediately believe in him, but if you were to just pray to God and tell him, prove yourself to me. And if you mean it when you say that, he will prove himself to you. That's all I'm going to say. I'm going to close on that. Okay, Jamie, thank you so much for that closing statement. Again, gentlemen, great work in terms of the prep. You both came with the sources, the visuals, and I really do appreciate that. Those are the best kinds of debate. So let me give you guys a 30 second uh, break right here. And I want to remind everybody, uh, this was another uh, big week of debates. So we kicked off the week. We had two debates in terms of the Evolution Debate Challenge series this week. Kent Hoven, Ryan Adler, round two. This one was fun. Uh, this one kickstarted the week. We also had uh, Wade the Wizard and uh, Dr. Dino. They debated uh, the saga continues. Evolution is on trial. That one we had a format that I really enjoyed. Kept the debate comprehensive. We almost we went for almost two and a half hours. So that was a great debate last night. We had a debate that I, I was pumped for, a lot of hype for this one. Pastor Matt first, David Preston, both uh, basically Clash of the Titans, one could say. David and Matt both know their stuff in terms of the uh, dispensationalism topic. And so uh, they debated. It was an informal debate. So it was comprehensive. We incorporated audience questions. We had a lot of discussion. And it just really was, in my opinion, probably the best debate out there on this topic. And so they debated who is true Israel. And uh, if you haven't yet seen that one, please do check it out. And today, is there scientific evidence for macro evolution? So four debates this week, four big debates this week. And the fun continues next week. So next week's going to be a busy week. We've got a good mix. Is theistic determinism biblical? Dan Chapa. Uh, C.J. Cox, Charles Jennings, and Turretin fan. They're going to be debating soteriology, um, Lordship Salvation versus Free Grace Theology. Uh, I'll be debating Grayson next week, the Great Ancestry Debate. Does genetics support universal or common ancestry? The middle of the month, we got some epic debates for you. The Great Baptism Debate is the Lutheran Doctrine of Baptism Biblical, Mark Gageton and Jeremiah Nortier. So this one's coming up. Guys, if you're not yet subscribed and, and you're addicted to debates like, like myself, make sure to hit that subscribe button. We've hosted about 250 debates now on all sorts of topics uh, next month as well. Well, actually, we're in next month, <laughs> December. Age of the Earth debate, uh, Mark Reed and T-Rock. So I also just booked uh, three main events for January 2023. So we're going to kickstart the uh, the month the right way. We're going to have a big uh, King James debate between Will Kinney and Dr. Stephen Boyce. I've also got a big eschatology debate between two pastors, Pastor Matt First and Pastor uh, Daniel Eldridge on is uh, the pre-trib rapture biblical. And uh, that's just two of the many uh, big events for 2023 to, to kickstart the year, the right one. So anyways, with that, Luca, Jamie, again, thank you so much for an epic debate. Break time is over. You guys earned it. And now let's get into some questions. So the first question that came in all the way at the beginning, question for the guests. And so it's a question for both. So we'll get both of your input here. Centurion is asking, if it takes 200 million years for two mutations to reach uh, saturation in an organism, how many mutations does it take to change an amoeba to a whale? How much time is needed? After reading through the question, I think it's more so directed at you, Luca. Mm -hmm. So let's allow you to start. And go ahead. First of all, amoeba and whales are completely different things. So in uh, evolutionary theory, we do not have uh, amoeba to whale evolution. That's a misconception. <laughs> misconception. How much time? Uh, I don't know. It depends. We do observe, so 
quite a huge changes uh, during even our lifetime but i think several million years i think uh, to get from a single cell organism to a whale uh, several hundred million years because a whale is a mammal so we have a long long way to go because we need to get to mammal uh, mammals so that's a huge step basically uh, from then you need to get something that uh, a mammal uh, in, that uh, goes on the ground and then you need to evolve it more to get away but if you look at that huge step in evolution is quite a to give a comprehensive uh, uh, story but you can look at the time chart to have uh, an idea i do not know the exact date i think uh, hundreds of millions of years thank you very much for the response luca jamie four zero yeah so as far as he said uh there's no evol there's no evolutionary process for amoeba to whale i mean i would agree on that but that's not what the charts show i mean i think ken hoven has showed probably 20 or 30 different charts where it starts with an amoeba it goes to a sponge and then from a sponge it goes to a whale and a dog and a cat and a lion so i mean yeah you don't want to admit that but that's exactly what your religion teaches um also i I wanted to just give a shout out to the three people that came in here and spent their whole time throughout this debate because I told them about it. Uh, so shout out to G Moose, shout out to F4, and shout out to Tom Walden. Thanks for supporting me, guys. Thank you so much there, Jamie. And yes, thank you to the gentleman that uh, stuck around the entire time. So uh, Luca, question was for you. And uh, good to see SpongeBob making yes. an appearance. Again. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, uh, to be fair, uh, no, uh, Meba do not turn into a whale, but they do have uh, a common uh, descent. Uh, so, yeah, we have that, but from a Meba to whale, no, it's not what's happening. And that was uh, was referring to. Uh, so yeah, and of course it do, does not uh, need to. Uh, the time up for evolution is not that big. Uh, from uh, something that was the common ancestor of amoeba and whale, yes, a lot of time. But you can observe evolution uh, during your lifetime. Okay, Luca, thanks for that final word. And next question comes in from Jeremy Nolan. Jeremy, thanks so much for your question. And he's asking, Luca, why is Neanderthal a different species from modern humans today? Can you please explain what makes something uh, become a different species from parent species? Well, uh, first of all, I think it's a subspecies because you can get hybrids from Neanderthals and us. So it's not exactly a different species, but how can you get to that when a population does not interbreed for a quite a long time, the difference will build up and it will become more difficult to reproduce. Uh, so in the case of Neanderthals, I think that hybrids were a thing, but all evidence point to either sterile hybrids or uh, very uh, few instances of hybrids uh, able to reproduce. Uh, we do have uh, some uh, Neanderthal DNA inside uh, us, Europeans. So yeah, uh, they someone, uh, somewhat uh, survive in our DNA. Uh, they were not a completely different species, but more as uh, some species they were able to do hybrids with us. Thank you, Luca. Uh, Jamie, over to you. So um, whenever we get into the whole human ape discussion, they love to bring out these elaborate stories. But I mean, I always ask, you know, where's 
where's the evolution, man? Like, where, where's the proof? Like, being you. That's what I'm waiting for. All right. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, it looks like SpongeBob and John Travolta himself yeah. have made an appearance. <laughs> I got more. Luca. <laughs> As explained uh, when uh, the two population became uh, distinct, so they do not interbreed anymore, they will grow separate. And you will get to a point where you can get hybrids. Hybrids are not uh, the same as what we are doing with other Homo sapiens. So you are talking about at least a subspecies. And then when uh, the two species do not interbreed anymore, you can talk about uh, two different species. And that's how it work. Okay, thank you, Luca, for that final word. Next question comes in from Tom Walden. Tom, thanks for the question. Question for Jamie. Stem cells have the potential to, to become any cell of the organism. Isn't it possible these stem cells could mutate, creating a new organism? I mean, I guess if you want to use that kind of wording, anything's possible. But the thing is, what do we see happening? You know, they want to say that uh, a stem cell could turn into any part of the organism. But the thing is, each one of those stem cells has DNA inside of it. And DNA is a code that gives them certain things that they are to do once they get to a certain stage of development. So that's where we see differentiation come into play. That's where we see specialization come into play is when the stem cells are formed. Now the DNA code is telling them, hey, it's time to do this. And then we see them turn into these different systems of the body, these different organs, these different functions. And that's what I think the evolutionists have such a hard time understanding is they want to ignore the DNA code, the program that was built into it. Because if they were to accept the fact that this DNA code has all this information designed into it, then they no longer can believe in evolution and they don't want to do that. So for them, I would say fail. Thank you, Jamie and Luca over to you. It does not work like that. Uh, First of all, our uh, stem cells do not reproduce uh, by themselves. Uh, you can get that with plants, uh, but usually you get a clone. Uh, it's possible to get some mutation. Theoretically, yes, it's possible, but it's not usually how that works. Basically, when you get a new organism from a stem cell, uh, I think about what I did with plants uh, when I was a uh, high schooler, uh, you get a clone. It's possible to get something uh, different. Yes, in theory, yes. Thank you, Luca. And Jamie, question was for you this time. You get the last word. I just want to tell everyone to make sure to uh, go uh, like, comment, subscribe, thumbs up, all that good stuff on all three of our channels, not just mine, on Standing for Truth, on Luca's channel. You know, I want everyone to see different opinions and then make the critical thinking decisions for themselves. Don't just take my word for it. Don't just take Luca's word for it. Don't just take Donnie's word for it. Listen to all sides and then analyze that and come to your own conclusion. Thank you, Jamie. Appreciate that. And um, okay, here's the next one. This one comes in from Speed Reader. And this one's for you, Luca. So Speed Reader is asking, you say wheat growing three times as much per plant means it's a different plant. With hormones and selective breeding, chickens have gotten three times the size. Is it no longer a chicken? It's a different thing. Uh, when you act on a, an organism already living, it's not evolution. Uh, living organisms do not evolve, population do. Uh, what I say that the uh, wheat plant, the modern one, is more big, produce more, so more seeds are not seeds, but I cannot remember the technical term, uh, cariotidi in Italian, but I cannot remember in English. So it's different. You have uh, more of 
uh, those structures and they are bigger and that's genetics and also you do not have just the size even though the size is still relevant because if you get uh, hormones uh, you will grow but your descendants will not it's not like if you pump yourself your children will be pumped too genetics is different and that's what we are talking about uh, on uh, the plants of modern wheat is different from acorn it has much more uh, chromosomes is uh, more resistant to diseases is more big it produces more those are actually different and uh, we can say that they look alike but the difference are there uh, of course for an untrained eye you cannot spot that that uh, on your first watch but if you study the topic you will see the difference okay thank you luca jamie floor is yours I mean, I think Speed Reader makes a great point here. I mean, I don't see what the difference is between the wheat being genetically modified to produce three times as much. And then we do the same thing with chickens and he doesn't want to accept that as a different organism. I mean, of course not, because it, it makes it sound like nonsense, which it is. So to Speed Reader, I just want to say good job on your little question because that was a great point to bring up so thumbs up to you on that um also i remember on my last debate speed reader was talking about doing after shows so maybe you can email me and we can start setting up after shows for my debates um emails contact at studio 215 official.com the website's in the works right now awesome jamie thank you uh so much there luca question was for you you get the yes last uh, the difference is uh first of all we are talking about even genome size and that's a different thing but also uh, if you get ripped like donny is quite uh, in uh, good shape his uh, sons are not that ripped maybe they are but they do not uh, bore they are not born in that way that's the difference if you pump up a chicken and uh, let that chicken uh, reproduce you will not observe any change in uh, his uh, sons and daughters if you have uh, on the contrary something like wheat uh, the difference is evident and is hereditary that's the difference appreciate it luca thanks so much um okay your favorite critic here uh jamie grayson's coming at you so he's saying sft yeah. question for jamie in cladomonas we do see specialized systems of function namely a body held together with ecm extracellular matrix i'm guessing and yep. cells specially for replication that meets your definition of differentiated systems. Uh, Jamie, go ahead. So I honestly already explained this. So I guess you're just not listening to me because you're too busy arguing with people in the live chat. So hopefully you'll listen this time, Grayson. Uh, the extracellular matrix, that's not new. The single cells could already do that before this colony was formed. Um, the specialty of reproduction that's also not new they've always been doing that the single cells were motile and they had germline functions which means that they could reproduce they already did that before this experiment what we saw in this experiment was that multiple daughter cells would come out of a parent and stay inside of their family colony let's call it and then they would assign roles between each other so some of them would say, I'm not going to be motile. I'm going to focus on reproduction. And others would say, I'm going to focus on re I'm going to focus on motility and I'll let y'all handle the reproduction. So we see them working together to, you know, survive these harsh environments by reserving their energy that they would be normally using to do both of these functions. And they're selecting which functions they're going to use. That's not specialization because it's nothing that the other ones couldn't do the ones that are non-motile they still could have been not they still could have been motile they decided to take the, they or they were assigned that role to be 
non-motile. Same thing with the germline. They could have also been germline, but they decided to take on the role of somatic. So again, this is not specialized because they both, all of these cells had the option to do either or. Okay, Jamie, thank you so much for that response. Luca, over to you. Yes, for what I can understand, the difference is there. There are specialized cells and that's a multicellular organism. I think that I can understand why Jamie do not want to call that a multicellular organism, but we are, uh, as we say in Italian, uh, we are claim climbing a uh, 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 mirrors. We are climbing mirrors to say that we are uh, trying quite hard to deny something. So that's all it is. I do not want to uh, be rude or anything like that, but it, that's what I say in this occasion. Okay, Luca, appreciate the response. Bring in the heat, <laughs> bring in the heat. Jamie, you gonna take that? You get, you get the last word, go ahead. So the whole we're climbing the mirrors thing, I've never heard that. I like that expression, and I don't take it offensive because I would say the exact same thing about evolutionists. I mean, I see y'all jump through so many hoops to fit your theory. So therefore, I mean, I'm not going to take it offensive because it's the exact same thing I would say to you. The problem is I see the world one way, and you see the world another way. And because of your foundation, everything you see moving forward, you're going to try and fit into that foundation. The thing with me is that I was not always a creationist. I actually believed in evolution at one point in time. And when I finally did the research on my own, that's when I started to realize this doesn't add up. So I have seen both sides of the story. You seem like you've just been kind of stuck on atheism and evolution your whole life. So I would implore you to consider looking at it through my lens and then see if you're convinced or not. And again, I want to remind everyone to like, comment, subscribe, and all that good stuff. Thank you, Jamie. And again, that question was for you, so we'll give you the last word. Um, okay, so next question comes in from Taylor K. Taylor, thank you for the question. And question is for Luca. How did DNA evolve from single strand into the double helix pattern seen in more complex organisms? Well, DNA is always uh, a double strand. Uh, you are confusing with the RNA, but DNA is always a double strand. So yeah, uh, it's not a thing. Uh, when I was talking about um, the ring DNA, it's not a single yeah. strand. It's still a double helix, but uh, it uh, does have a different structure because uh, chromatin has proteins uh, binding uh, the DNA. So you can store basically the DNA. It's like a coil. It goes around those proteins and it can be stored. Ring DNA does not work like that. It's a simple uh, double helix strand. So yeah, you start from RNA and then you get to DNA. DNA usually is double strand. Okay, thank you, Luca, for the response. Jamie, over to you. We'll let him have the last word on that. That's fine. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Comes in from, uh, looks like we've got another question, I believe, from Tom Walden. Let's see here. Tom, question for Jamie. Science is growing exponentially every year. If a scientist could create a simple life form, in brackets, bacteria, in a lab, would it change your belief in evolution? So I've heard people mention this before when I debate them on the streets, because until now I didn't really do official debates. I just kind of argued with people that were willing to listen. <laughs> and they always say that, you know, if we can create life in a lab, uh, would it prove evolution? Um, first off, I would say it doesn't exactly prove evolution. What it proves 
I mean, it, it would prove a form of evolution, but that evolution would then be more of a biblical evolution because now you're proving that a designer had to be a part of the equation in order for it to evolve. The second thing I would say to them is go do it. You have so much technology in your hands. Why have we not gone into the lab and created life? I want to see this happen. But when I mention that to them, this is essentially what they do right here. That right there. You see that? that? That's what they do. They just kind of slowly creep out into the bushes and disappear because they know they can't do it. So, I mean, I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay, Jamie, thanks so much for the response. Luca, yes. anything uh, you'd like to add? As a chemist, add? I can say that chemists, all they do, they set condition. They, are, they have some clever ways to do things like that. But if you can uh, find a pathway that can be reproduced in nature, you basically, you found a pathway uh, potentially uh, that can happen in nature too. Uh, that's how this thing works. It's not like I'm uh, a chemist, I'm working on salt or things like that. So I'm making those uh, molecules. Uh, they assemble the, themselves. They, we have uh, some clever ways to make the molecules assemble in the way we want, yes. But if you can show that the same process can happen in nature too, then you have a, a viable uh, pathway. Thank you, Luca. You can have the last word, Jamie, if you'd like it. Yeah, I just want to reiterate that if you could create life in a lab, you just proved that you have to have a designer to create it because we don't witness that anywhere. On top of that, there's so many variables to that. Like what constitutes life? Is it successful? Is it viable? Can it reproduce? There's so many things that go into that. Life is not just putting together chemicals, um, amino acids to create proteins. And then those proteins just magically start breathing and having babies. There's so much more that goes into that. Um, another thing I was reading the comments while he was explaining that and SpongeBob imagination in the comments, shout out to uh, SpongeBob. I'll give him a little SpongeBob cause he loves it so much. Um, he said in quotes, they will totally create life from non-life in the lab in 20 years. And then in parentheses, um, what they promise us every 20 years. And that's essentially what it comes down to. So yeah, I'll just close out with that. Okay, Jamie, thanks so much. And I think what we'll do is wrap it up with this final question here from Gate Watchers to everybody who sent in questions. Thank you so much. I always appreciate it. Also to those who sent in uh, just love, support, good feedback, super chats. Thanks again. Uh, always helpful to the ministry here. So this comes in from Gate Watchers. Looks like it's a question for you, Luca. We'll make this the last question of the night. And Gate Watchers is asking, how do evolutionists explain the origins of high-tech tool marks in ancient caves that match up to other caves worldwide? Okay. For what uh, I can understand, uh, those objects are either falsified or not real <laughs> but i do not know enough on the subject to discuss about it mm -hmm. i heard about that but basically it's all i know uh, i heard that they were fakes but uh, to be honest i cannot prove to you that they are maybe you are right uh, i would do research uh, that when I do not know something, I do not know. Well, I appreciate it, Luca. Jamie, anything you'd like to add? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, anytime I hear uh, someone respond to a question like that with, it's more than likely a fake, uh, that means that they're afraid to like actually dig into it and because they're more than likely going to find out that it's not a fake and it actually does go completely against their theory. Um, so I just think that's hilarious. Every time I hear that, that's just kind of the first thought that pops into my head. Um, and yeah, I mean, we see people saying that, oh, it's, it's more than likely fake all the time, but I mean, that's just like when we see the human footprints right next to the dinosaur footprints, they're like, oh, that's fake. But yet we have hundreds, dozens of people that were there on site that witnessed to it being a real fossil found. So yeah, whenever people say that it's fake, I don't, 
I don't even buy into that. That's just them, you know, dodging again with the whole Homer thing, you know, just quietly fading out into the distance and hoping no one notices it. Jamie, thank you so much. And Luca, question was for you. You get the last word. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, so uh, I literally do not know enough to discuss this topic, but I want to give a shout out to uh, Taylor. Uh, you are right. I was wrong on DNA. So yeah, uh, viruses does have a uh, single strand uh, DNA. So yeah, I was wrong. Sorry about that. Well, I appreciate that, Luca. Thank you so much. And again, to the debaters tonight, Luca and Jamie, thank you both for giving us your time for this important debate on large-scale evolution or macroevolution. So great job to the both of you in terms of the prep and just the visuals you brought and the sources and so on and so forth. So before we completely wrap it up, let's give the opportunity to the debaters for some final words, final thoughts. Luca, let's start with you. Again, thanks so much for doing this. And, yes, it was um, a fun debate. I want to do more. Uh, I basically live for that. <laughs> Just think that uh, here is basically yeah. morning. Uh, it's five o'clock <laughs> in the morning. And uh, yeah, I love debating that much. Uh, also, as Donny uh, know, I came from a very rough day. <laughs> so yeah, but I love these things too much. Well, I appreciate your commitment, Luca. You have stayed up late or early uh, to do this debate. So thank you so much. You're on you know, the other side of the world, basically. So again, thanks for the great debate. Jamie, thank you again for being here. Uh, let's get some final words, final thoughts. Yeah, um, I want to say thanks to Luca for taking the time because I know how hard it is to be on different time zones. I have a couple friends that I used to game with and they'd be up at like four in the morning while it's like midnight for me or whatever. So I know it's rough doing that. So I appreciate you doing that. Um, also, I want to say thanks to all the people out there that are, you know, supporting us and supporting all of this effort we put into these debates. I mean, you guys see the final product of us coming out here and, you know, presenting our, our arguments, but there's a lot of work that goes on in the background. And especially when it comes to like Donnie scheduling it and, you know, there's a lot of, it's a lot of time that gets put into this. So I appreciate the the effort that people are putting into um, supporting us in that. And as far as we're going with the whole support thing, I do want to remind everyone to make sure to do those donations. <laughs> Can you do, do I think that last little CGI you did might have been a little too much for the yeah. system. <laughs> you yeah. Kind of out in robot mode. <laughs> but we got most of it. Looks like it was it was yeah. raining dollar bills. So yeah. <laughs> thanks so much, Jamie, for those final words. And uh well said. Well said, because yes, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. And as a fellow debater, I know that debate prep is hours and hours and hours and hours worth of work. So if, if you're one who takes it seriously, and I do, and you do too. So, okay, Luca, Jamie, thanks again for this epic debate. To the audience, thanks so much for being so engaged in this debate. And thank you for uh, all the questions that have come in and the feedback. So make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, share around to your friends and family. Speed Reader, thank you so much for the last second. Super sticker there. And uh, we'll see you guys next week for another week of epic debates. With that being said, Stand for Truth is out. God bless all.